Okay, let's get started. So I grade assignment one, and I've uploaded it so you can download it. Um, I also posted the grades, so you're going to get that. And there are a few issues that I want to talk about in assignment one. So before I begin, are there any questions? On average, pretty good. Um, so comments, um, I made a few comments on the, on some of the on assignments while I took points off, but the general comments I'll go through now. So this first example shows three issues that come up from time to time. I'm not quite sure why they do. Um, the first one is there's some odd spacing that's going on here. Um, there's space here. Okay, that makes sense. Space, you know, why is there space right here? And why is there space there? Right? Um, you know, that's not clear what I mean, the space is odd. Um, and then when we look at the comments, well, it's like initialized variables. Yes, that's what's happening. Um, for loop from number zero to n, yes, there's a for loop that goes from zero to n. Um, if condition to get I mean, the the can the comments are just repeating the code, right? Um, my favorite example to illustrate this is you have some line of code that x equals x plus one, and then you say, oh, I'm adding one to x, right? You're just repeating the code and comments, right? And the code you're repeating is quite obvious, right? It's clearly initializing variables, it's clearly the for loop. Those comments don't add anything to understanding the program, right? They just make it a little harder to read, but then you, you have to sort of go around the comments and find the code, right? The third thing is, it's a function, right? And the function is not returning any value. What they're doing is they're printing out the results, right? And so they're creating a function, like it's some sort of conversation between the programmer and the, the, the computer, right? The problem with this is you, can, you cannot use that result in any computation, right? When you call it, the output's going to go to standard out, whatever that is, and you can't then do anything else, right? You know, so here is the spacing removed, made it a little more reasonable, comments removed. Um, you know, it's just a little bit easier to read. And once you can do that, you start saying, you got this weird if statement in the middle, which basically it does nothing, right? Um, so why not get rid of that if statement, right? And now we can use the four and then say if, give that first if and give it else and just say if this is true, then we do this. Otherwise, we don't do anything. Same logic. Um, it becomes clear what the code is doing, right? Same. Code, um, so it's just from and I, I mean, where are they? Well, you're actually declaring two I's, right? One is declared in the var, and then the loop declares its own I, so we don't need that. And the from, well, what do they mean from? That's 
that's the sum you're computing, right? So again, it becomes a little bit clearer, I think. And then it turns out that in Scala, we can combine the if and the for. It looks, you know, it's not very common, so it doesn't probably feel foreign, right? But it can be done. Um, and then there was the name, right? Um, I was surprised that no one commented on this. Um, what's the naming convention in Java? What's that? That's camel case, right? Um, and so Scala is, runs on top of the JVM. And so it uses the same naming convention. Where these underscores come from? Well, I recycled some problems from last year, and last year we were using Julia, and Julia uses these crazy underscores. I don't like it, but that's what they use. Um, and I forgot to remove them, and I'm surprised that no one said, "Hey, what, what's what's these stupid underscores?" Um, that's not what you do in Java. It's not what you do. And scale up. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. So I was just surprised that no one is, no one. Said, hey, what's with these underscores? Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, here's, well, so here was original, and then it drops under that. Um, it's shorter, a little easier to read. Um, another example. And again, we got this big comment, right? And it really, it really breaks the code up, right? So it becomes harder to read, and it's like, well. You know, there's the code without that comment, so it becomes a little bit easier to see what's going on, right? Um, and now the question is, can we rearrange it to get rid of these? You know, they felt the needs. I have this if statement, I'm doing nothing. I got this else, I'm doing nothing, right? So they felt the need to explain it. And when that happens, it's like after. You ask yourself, there's a way I can rewrite the code to get rid of that problem, which is irritating me, but I don't need the comment, right? Well, that last else we don't need, right? Because it's going to get rid of it. Um, and then we can find these conditions. Um, helps get rid of some of the awkwardness. Now again, you got this function that's one line long, and you've got two or three blank lines and a blank line or two afterwards. Like, it's not clear why. Um, so it's just easier, right? I mean, it's just easy to read. There's no, there's no need for the, all that extra white space. And of course, since it's Scala, we can actually do it in one line, right? If if your function is just one line long, you can skip the curly brackets and just question so far.
you know, again, it's like, you know, what's with all this extra white space? Right, so it makes it a little harder to read. Four men, I mean, it really becomes hard to see the structure of the code, right? You have it, you've got a function. And you get another block and a block inside of a block and an if statement inside of a block inside of a block, right? Um, you know, standard is we Right. The standard is you indent in, you know, and each block you indent so that visually you can see the structure of the code. You know, here to create three files, right? And so it's like, okay, a new print writer is random and for all, equals one to a thousand. You know, write this file, write this, right? Close. New print writer for right close. New print writer for right close, right? We have functions, right? And we can create so we don't have to repeat all that logic over again. You know, create a function, give it a name, and then I can call it. And then it becomes a little bit easier to see what's going on. Here's the function. Here's what it's going to do. And then now I can write. Now again, um, there's this, you know, why two blank lines, two blank lines? I mean, why is this odd spacing not clear? You know, then we get up, oh, a comment tells me what the answer is going to be. Um, and then it does this calculation in the comment. It's like, so you get a calculator out and do the calculation and type in a comment and I'm going, but you're in the language allows you to do this directly, right? So why not do it in the language and so you can see the calculation and people can repeat it. And oh, by the way, when you do the calculation, it's not 0.82, it's 0.8265. And so if you're going to truncate, you don't truncate it to 0.82, you round up to 8. 0.83, right? Um, and so a number of people were, you know, they're doing these calculations on the side and then embedding them in comments or in text. It's like, you know, we can do this, right, in, um, in Scala so you can, people can reproduce it and see what the answer is, right? Why not do it there instead of on the side and embed it in a text for comment? And then maybe you can then use that result in the comment and explain what's going on, right? But yeah, so we can do that. We can do the calculation, and then we can use the result in in text if you want to talk about it. So here, um, you 
Dennis Campbell case, right? So when he, when we have a name of a function, does it start in lowercase or uppercase? Right? And in the Java world, it's we start like functions with lowercase. Right? Classes start with uppercase. If we're in C sharp, yes, then methods start uppercase letter. But we're not in the C sharp world. Um, And in general, you know, want to give your variable names meaningful descriptions to explain how they're, what, what role they're playing in the code. Um, you know, here we're just basically saying it's a file, it's a writer, an array. Um, You know, plus that name, create, it doesn't tell us what we're going to create, right? Um, you know, we're basically going to open a file and put a bunch of numbers in it. Um, and the name create doesn't tell us. We don't know, right? The name doesn't tell us what we're going to do. And so the only way to know what we're creating is to look inside the function and see what it's doing. Now we get to a question raised earlier. Um, so people did things like this, right? You know, how do we test to see whether multiples of, multiples, uh, mul some multiples of three and five, right? So that they would do this, so they'd print the result out, and then you get the answer. Um, and you're going, is that the right answer? How do we know what's the right answer? Is that, but it has to be a sum. It has to be a sum, right? And so one way you do it is you just you look at your code, I think it's right, and that prints out the answer, so that must be right, right? Um, the other way is you take out a piece of paper and you write, you know, do the calculation. Oh, there's the answer, right? How many people did that? And everyone else just turned out the answer and assumed it was correct, right? You never make mistakes? Other than products. Is that the right answer? Again, either you just print it out and assume that your code is correct, or you, you did it on the side, right? And then, oh yeah, right, that's the right answer. But if you're doing the side, um, you know, that piece of paper is gone the next day, right? You come back to your, your, your code a month later, we don't know if that's the right answer. You have, to do that, you have to do that side calculation all over again. Same thing with multiples of thumb, right? This one's like, you know, it's nice to know that it it does, but how are we going to verify that, use this to, to convince someone that your code is actually producing the right result? Does it convince you? I mean, when I look at that, I go, my immediate reaction is, there's no way I'm going to try and calculate this, right? The only way is I'm going to write my own function and verify my function works, and then I'm going to put that string in and see if I get the same answer. But if I have to rewrite the code to verify your code, no. Not good, right? Um, Oh, and then I was like, they put a space at the end, right? Oh, that would, 
this guaranteed, right? Even if I wrote my own function, right, and made sure it worked correctly and I entered this in, I'm likely to miss that space. And that's going to get a different answer, right? Um, well, so, so what about this, right? Um, if I did this, right, then what it does is it sort of tells me, okay, oh, by the way, it wasn't 2870, it's 2880. But, again, where do these numbers come from? You sit down on a piece of paper and you're like, okay, it's supposed to be, you know, six. And so let's see, any less than six, so there's a three and a five, and I'll, oh, I guess that's eight. And then, oh, I'll go up to ten. And so now I got to, well, and then there's, there's the three, and then there's the five, and then there's a six, and then there's a nine, right? And so you start doing the calculation either in your head, but that's my limit, right? Go down here, I have to do a piece of paper, that's your piece of paper, and that's like, oh, really? Um, what about this? You know, what does this do, right? Now when I look at Oh, six, that tells me, oh, it's, it's a three plus a five, right? So now to, for me to verify that it's right, I go, is that the right sequence? Yeah, it's six, so those are the numbers. So I don't know what the actual result is, but I know that that calculation will give me the right result. And if now my multiple of thumbs equal that, then I'm good, right? Same thing with 10, 11, and 20, right? Because now I can verify, oh, I need all the multiples of 3 and 5 and not 15 under 20, like 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, 12, well, 15 doesn't work, and 18 works, and then we don't, it's up to not including, so we don't do the 20, right? Um, so there it is, right? Now if I run this, right now I know, right, if these come out true, then I can look at them and say, yes, that's supposed to be the correct answer, and I wrote results in true, um, so I can do that. And then if we go a little further, right, we have a cert. Um, and what does a cert do? Anyone? What happens if it is correct? What would happen if it's not correct? Actually, no, that's that's not true. Right? This is not a cert in um J unit or scale unit. This is just a standard C, C++, Java, assert, right? And what does that do? Um, if it's true, it basically doesn't do anything. If it's false, it throws an exception, right? So it's not as good as running J unit, um, which we can do in Scala, but you can't do in the, in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so basically, if you run this, nothing happens. If the code, code doesn't throw an exception, then we know things work. I don't have to look at the, I don't have to look, when I do this, I have to go look for all the trues and falses, right? Are there any falses? I have to go lift. When I run the certs, it's like, okay, as long as I end normally, I'm good. And then products, again, we can, Now, why is this important, right? Um, 
you know, when you're turning an assignment, these are pretty simple methods. And well, you probably, well, how many people wrote these methods and got it right the first time? Yeah, no one, no one's raising their hand, right? So even these simple methods, right? You make, first time I, when I did sum up the sum, I, I got it wrong too, right? This is common. It's very, it's not very common to write a gold, what I call a gold star function where you write it the first time and it's perfectly, it's all correct, right? It's like, oh, I forgot this, I forgot that. Indexing is wrong. Some, you screw something up, right? And so it's nice to have some way of verifying, you know, when, you know, when you get it right. But, you know, if we're going to run a program on a cluster of 20 machines, and the 20 machines are going to run for five hours, um, it's going to be really painful if you discover later that you did something wrong, right? Um, and it's going to be harder to, it's going to be harder than finding what you did wrong because you have 20 machines doing computation for five hours. Um, it's doing a lot of stuff, right? So we need to, we need some way of being able to be confident that when we start burning through the, all that CPU time, which is going to cost money, that our code, it, it does what we think it does, right? It does what it should be doing. Right. The larger the problem, the more complex the code, the more the more important it is to be able to oh make sure that each step is doing properly, right? And when you start adding distributed computing, it even gets more complicated because now you got multiple machines involved too. Any questions so far? This is why I was nasty and ding people, right? When when you just said, "Oh, I'm, I'm going to call this function, and here's the result, and that's my that's my test case." No, that's just that's not telling me is that the right answer or not, right? We need to know. Okay, when I write these functions, am I going to get the right answer? Right? You know, particularly when you're crunching a big set of numbers, right? And you're doing all kinds of, even just computing the average, how do you know what's the right average? Right? You don't know, right? When you got a thousand, you got a million numbers and computing the average, did I do something wrong? Well, you don't know what the average is, so looking at the output doesn't really help you. Um, you know, again, we have a for loop that's not intended, so it's not, well, it's actually hard to read, but okay, it is there. Why are we printing out the entire array? Well, when you're debugging, it's nice to know what's going on, right? Okay, so fine, you're going to print it out like you're there, and then I'm going to get the min and max location. I can, I can input the values. I can, I can see the output is telling me where it's going, right? And then I can look at the output and say, yeah, there's the min, there's the max. Um, but when we're done, take them off, right? We don't need, you know, once you, once you figure out the function is working correctly, then we don't need the debug statement, right? You know, there is, in software engineering, they tell us when you're building an application, and they, they say this in terms, in the context of a GUI application, that you want to separate the interface from the computation or the model, right, or the business logic. Why? Because they're different things, for one thing. Two, they, they change at different rates. Um, and usually, you know, the business logic or calculation can be complicated. The interface might be complicated. 
And when you mix two complicated things together, it gets even more complicated, right? So you want to separate it. Here's the interface. Here's the logic, right? When you have a function like this, you want to separate out the computation from what you do with it, right? So you have the function, it returns the values. If you want to print it out, you call the function, get the value out, and then you can print it, right? So we, that way, do I want to go into a file? I can write it to a file. I want to do the screen, I go to the screen, right? If I can do whatever I want with that output. Once I embed it inside your function, you're assuming that you want it to go to standard out. Right, and if you don't want to go now, want to go to the file, we but you're going to go inside and, and modify the function and recompile it. No, just keep the two separate. Right, you have a computation, you return a result, and now I can take this, I can print it out if I want, I can put it in a file, I can use it in another computation if I want. So, print statements are fine when you're debugging, right, and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and if that's what you want to do, computation over here, get the result, and then you can print it out. Um, this particular code, the pattern count, okay, we know, we know what it's doing, right? You have a string, and then you have a pattern, and you, you stick the pattern up next to the first letter, and you start comparing, until you get a mismatch, and then you move the pattern one forward, right? And you start over again. That's what it's doing, and it's like, okay, there's the first while loop. It's going to tell us where we're going to start, and here's the one that's going to move us forward. And then you go, what? It took me 10 minutes to figure out how this works. Before I even start, I know, I mean, I know what that while is, I know in theory what it's doing, and I know in theory what that's doing, right? Now I have to figure out how is it working? And it's hard because you go flag two, you have no idea what flag two is, right? What's flag zero, one, flag three, I have no idea, right? And the only way to figure out what they are is to understand what's going on. And so you, you sit down and you write an example and you go, okay, flag one is this and flag two that value, and then you, you step through it over and over several times, and you're like, ah, flag one is this, and flag zero is this, and, right? And, of course, 20 minutes later, I forgot. I mean, I don't know, right? And so every everyone who reads this code to figure out, understand what's going on, they have to sit down and been 10 minutes to figure out what's going on. When you pick names, you want to pick names which reflect what the code, what that variable is being used, right? The name flag tells you nothing, right? It has no context. It says, this is, there's some condition I'm going to check later on. What is the condition? I have no idea, right? So you have no idea what it's checking for, right? No context, right? So just forget it. Don't never use flag, right? It doesn't tell you anything. And then one, you know, one, two, and three. What's the difference? Don't know. Have no idea. So they better names, right? You know, flag two is it that offset we're going to use to start, uh, right? How many times does it match, right? Um, where we are in the pattern. Not the best names, but give us a little better idea of what they're being used for. It's going to help us understand the logic of what's going on. Um, what does system exit do?
Right? It's like, you know, the function, or if n is greater than less than zero, like, well, what well, doesn't make any sense. So we're going to print out there's an error and then call system exit. What does system exit do? Your program is done, right? It exits the program, which means the program can't recover, right? System exit is usually not a good idea. Why? Because if, if, if someone's interacting with it, and all of a sudden the program just blew up and they have no idea why. It's better to tell them why and then say, I have to quit, right? Um, so, And usually the only place you want to use this method is like when you throw up a dialogue window and say, do you want to quit, right? And they say, yes. And then you can just an exit. Um, other than that, it's, it, it, it's really an extreme measure. Um, in this case, throw an exception, right? And that way, you know, the, the caller can then catch exception and decide what to do. Maybe the right thing to do is exit. Um, but then the caller can decide, not the function, right? And if you throw an exception, you can give it a message, and the message could be, you know, you know, can't compute the sum of make a number, or n has to be positive. So we don't need the print statement. And you have to keep in mind, right? When you're doing this assignment, you're, you're sitting at your terminal or command line or Jupyter Notebook, your IDE, and you're interacting with it and you're seeing that print statement come out, right? But if you want to use this function in a computation, that print statement does not help us, right? We can't, when we call this and you print it out, we cannot use that, we, we can't capture that information to do anything about it. I don't know what happened. Um, and again, you know, same idea. There's a print statement saying, look, you, you input some bad data. Um, if you view this as a conversation between you and your code, yes, but if we're going to use this um, function elsewhere, the print statement doesn't help us. Um, in that line, Could probably use a little extra white space. Um, no space, maybe a space there and a couple of spaces on the equal to make it easier to read. And I see, I see this a lot for some reason. And of course, you can just do that. You don't need that local variable to hold it so I can return it the next statement. And then of course, we could just even simplify that in scalar. And again, it's like, no, there's a function here, so we indent, right? And why is there, you know, a, a blank line between every line of code? That just, that really stretches the code out, makes it hard to read. 
Né? And then again, we don't we don't need that print statement, so it becomes. And again, I mean, you know, once we again, we're doing the same pattern, right? You're creating a local variable just to return it, so why not just return it initially? You know, like, oh, again? And then what is... Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't figure it out. What is derpy? I mean... <laughs> you know, I often tell my students that uh, university... Um, are not a good place to learn how to become a programmer, right? They're, they're not good at teaching programming. Um, you know, programming is a skill that needs to be practiced. Um, and, you know, practice doesn't mean repeating the same thing over and over again. It means you do something and then you evaluate what you've done and see what you do better, right? But universities, Right, you got a class of 60. You know, how long do you think it took me to go through all your code, right? I mean, first of all, I have to load it up in a notebook over and over and over again 60 times, right? And then once it's loaded and the compiler starts, you know, it starts with another scalar instance, right? And then anyway, and then you, you go through, um, it, it, right? And then I sit down and think about, oh, should I talk about this problem and, and capture all these comments, right? I, how many other places, how many other instructors do this? No, right? What do they do? They say, well, they run the code, output's right, points, right? Um, they might say, oh, it's important to comment. And then they look at your code, oh, yeah, there's comments, right? Check, right? Why? Because, you know, you got 60 people here in this class, and you got 30 people in that class, and you got other stuff to do, right? Um, but you don't get that feedback. No one says, look, this is, this is nonsense. Don't do this, right? Input, output, correct. Check, right? These comments check. Do they read the comments? No. So what do you do? You just put in arbitrary comments and it satisfies them, right? So you don't get the feedback. So nearly everyone that goes through a program, their goal is to become a programmer, right? Or software developer. They, they're, but we don't treat that seriously in academics, right? We don't spend the time, right, to go through and look at your code and give you comments. Um, it takes time, it takes energy. And there's all of things like this, right? Um, Another example, right again, there, what they're doing is, you know, here's what they're supposed to do and expected results. You know, so again, they're telling me, um, but we, we can do some of the computation, right? And then we can, below the computation, so like we did this calculation, then we can do this. But, you know, in Jupyter Notebook, we've got to build, it's like a, it's like a spreadsheet, right? We need a calculation right there. And so we can do it there, and then, then we can explain it, right? So there's no need to do this in your head or start doing these things on paper and then copying it, comments or text. We do the calculation, and then we can explain it. Um, yeah, just, just do the calculation, and then we can, we can explain the significance of the calculation. And then someone can repeat it and find out that it's 0, 0, 2, 8, 2, 6 and not 0082, right? Um,
And again, I start looking at this and it's like, okay, write file and, you know, time one, ran, read phantom files, average, sort, median, blah, blah, blah. Right, yes. R times R ray, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And so basically they did it once and they copied and pasted and copied and pasted, right? And then what matters is the differences. That's why we've got functions, right? We can use functions to Another example where we did the calculation, they print it out, and when you run the code, you can see it, but we cannot use any of these calculations anywhere else. Right? This, we're printing things out. So here's how I mean, actually did it, right? They create a function error, right? Actual, expected. And then they do a calculation. Um, and then there's a function called time and you give it a function, right? And so it, it starts the time, ends the time, and returns the result and the time, right? And now they can just time average and put a file, right? Time medium file, right? Very nice. They calculate the be in the air, they've been calculated actually running a, a function and timing how long it takes. Did it once and they can call it and then they can get the get the result and now they print out the result, right? They don't do the printing out in the calculation. So they encapsulated like the calculation in, in two functions. They can call the functions and then print out the results. Any questions? Right? Just... Yeah, right. I mean, there it is. A nice function, right? You don't. You don't we don't have to compute that over and over again. I have to time something. I'm going to time at the time. I've got three separate files. I'm going to time the mean, and the median. So do it once, and now here they created a, a separate um, function. If they didn't need to, they could do the top level, right? Create the two, create a file, time it, time it, right? Print the result. And then we create the next file and time it and time it, print the result out. Yeah, I mean, it's, the only thing you're repeating is basically the size of the file you want to create, right? So yeah, now let's see. Do I do this? Well, um, names temp every variable you're going to create in every program you write your entire career is temporary, right? Now it turns out that um, I do know of some people who have written variables which have survived, um, let's see, since like 1980. So we're talking about 37 years and it'll probably last um, continuous running for at least another 20 years, right? So those people could probably claim that um, they've written variables which are not temporary. Um, doesn't help us much, right?
Um, Now again, do we need all these print statements? Um, we just remove the print statements and then return the calculation. And the only thing you do is, is that what happens if n is negative or less than three? Do we turn zero or do we want to throw an exception when it's negative or not? And that's a policy decision to make on that function. Okay, finally, something more interesting. Um, so I wanted to look at space complexity. Um, so we have this file. Um, we read, you know, from the file. We get the lines, right? It's got an array buffer. Um, how much space does it take to do this? If my file has n numbers in it, anyone know how much space that appending to the array buffer will take? It's going to draw. On so does anyone know what the standard policy is in that case? So the standard policy in most languages, most systems is you you fix some small number, maybe five or 10 to start off with, right? Capacity, you just sort of guess what. Um, and then what you do is when you reach the capacity, you double the size. And then you copy, right? And then you, and you keep on doubling, right? And why do you double? Because when you double, what happens is the amount of space, the amount of copying you do is linear. It's not quadratic. It also means that the space you're using, right, is linear. Now, they do this for a certain, so you start with a small size, 5, 10, 20, whatever it is, and you start doubling, at some point, when you get too large, you go to a different policy. It's not, it's doubling becomes really too expensive, right? When you've got a million elements, you want to double to two million. So this basically, this policy general base-wise is going to take up two n, right? Now, how do I get an array out of it? Well, you, you know, if we're lucky, they might just have the array and the buffer point to the same location, right? But that might be tricky because it, then if you change, add something to the array buffer and the array is pointing the same thing and then it gets more, gets larger. And so this could be another copy, right? So now we're at three n, right? So now we need to do calculate the, the median and the average. So let's just do the average. Remember now we're at three n, right? Now we're going to face now we're going to face right. So now we want to calculate the average. Um, well. To do this, we need, we convert to a big decimal, right? Um, so here's, here's convert to big decimal. Um, and so again, they create an array buffer. And we're going to copy that in, you know, we're going to draw again, right? And that 2n, right? So we were at 3n. This copying is going to make us to 5n, right?
Right? So now, um, oh, but then we have to convert. So there is 6n, right? When we're dealing with 100 numbers, 500 numbers, and 6n doesn't matter, right? Dealing with a million numbers, 6n is a big number, right? When we're dealing with big data, you have to worry about space complexity, right? Like I said, if you know if it's a hundred numbers and you go from you, you use six n, who cares, right? It's just six hundred numbers, and that's no big deal. If the million numbers now you're consuming space for six million numbers, that starts to that starts to be a lot of space. Um, yeah. Well, instead of doing this convert, what we could do is just go through the array one at a time, and then in our sum, right, just convert it to a big. And that reduces, well, the convert had, was it 3n? So we just, by doing this, we went from 6n to 3n. Right? That can be significant. So far, so good. And then we could use reduce, right? But that's not going to change our complex, our space complexity. It just reduces. Um, let's take, look at the space complexity of doing it this way. So what do we do? Um, well, we have a, a sum, an account, and then we get a pointer to a file, right? And then we iterate through getting each line one at a time, and then I convert that line to an int, and then a big decimal adds the sum, and then I get my count, right? And then when I'm done, I can then convert, I can compute the average. What's the space complexity of computing the averages file this way? Well, there's one slot. There's, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a big decimal, whatever that is. So there's a long, right? And then a pointer, you know, some sort of we're not sure what that structure is. It takes up some space, but it's a fixed constant, right? And then I read a line at a time, in which this case is one number at a time, right? And that's it. So we went from 6n, right? 6n to... It's a constant, right? There's no n involved at all. Right? It doesn't matter whether there's a 10 numbers in the file, a million numbers in the file, or a billion numbers in the file, right? We're going to take the same amount of space in this program. Because we don't, we never read all 
of the number of n at a time. To compute the average, we don't need them all at the same time, right? Is that, is that clear? And again, when you're dealing with, you know, 100 numbers, 1,000 numbers, it doesn't matter, right? When you're dealing with three terabytes of data, you have to worry about these things. You have to say, oh, that's a lot of stuff. How am I going to, how am I going to do a calculation I need? It's all not going to fit in memory. Right? So we have to be aware of the time and space complexity of what we're doing when because when you're dealing with large other data, it's going to become important. We can also ask the question, should I make that a big decimal or should I just make it a long? Right? Or a, a double, right? Or, and why is that going to matter? Um, typically, big decimals are more expensive to deal with, right? Because they give you arbitrary precision both ways. Do we need that or not? You know, if we're adding up integers, then a long might do it. It actually might be faster. And again, if we're dealing with doing it for millions and millions of numbers, it, it could be significant. Questions? You know, so another example of this is computing the, you know, the min-max, right? Um, so there were, you know, several ways people did this. One way as well. You just sort the array and then take the first and last element. We're done, right? Um, what's the time complexity of that? It's not log n, n log n, right? Yeah. Um, what's the time complexity of doing the min and the max? It's n, because how do you find the min? You do a linear sweep, right? And then, right, do the max new the linear sweep. Right, so doing, we went from n log n to n, right? Now, if we're, if we're dealing with very large set, data sets, um, you don't want to do this. Anyone know why? Anyone ever guess? What's that? No, it's not a memory leak. You can do it in one sweep, yes. And what's the advantage of that? What's that? Um, it actually could be much faster than that. Why? How could it, how could doing one sweep be more than twice as fast as doing two sweeps? But that's not going to be, that's maybe pretty insignificant, right? A few, yes.
What's the memory hierarchy? The memory hierarchy on machine. You got the you've got the memory on your chip, right? And then you've got the L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, right? And then when you miss those caches, what happens? Your main memory, and then when you miss hard disk, right? And so the problem is, again, when you, when you do something like this, again, when we've got a thousand numbers, it's not a big deal, right? But when you start getting large data sets, all of a sudden, it's all not going to fit in main memory. So you're going to use virtual memory. And when you do this scan, oh, you're, you're paging in and out, right? You're, you're chunking a page, and now we need to go, we go to the next page where to chunk that page in, and through lots of paging, it can really slow you down. Um, so do you want to do two sweeps when you're doing lots of paging? Oh, that's going to be really slow, right? And so doing one sweep is going to get rid of that a lot of paging, right? And the real problem is when you finish when you finish that first first sweep, what's in memory? The pages for the end, and so you're going to, have to swap them all out, right? And that's why you know doing twice like this could be more than twice as slow because when you start this one, that first set. First elements may be in memory, right? But you're guaranteed when you're done, it's not. And so again, we have to be careful of understanding what the machine is doing when you have large data sets, right? Because that's going to affect the performance. Question? No, this takes two sweeps because it, the man is just going to do one sweep, right? Yeah, yeah I'm not. Oh yeah, I mean, you can use reduce and reduce. You pass in an element at a time, and what you return for reduce is a tuple, right? And the tuple contains the min, the current min, the current max, right? And then you get the new element. Oh, I, do I increment or decrease? Do I change one of the min or max? Of course, the standard software engineering policy is what we do is we try and make the code understandable, and then we run it. And if we've got performance problems, then we start, right? Um, that's pretty clear, right? What it's doing. But again, when you start doing large data sets, we have to be very careful of what we're doing because we're going to run across boundaries you're not typically used to running across. And that can have tremendous impact on the performance. Okay, so some questions for you. If I've got a thousand integers, right, or a million integers, and they range between zero and max and divided by two, how much space will it take in memory? Yeah, how many bits will it take? Okay, first question is, um, what is the native word size of the machine we're using? Is it 32 bit or the 64 bit? Yeah, does anyone in this room have a machine which does not run 64 bit native? One of the last time Intel wrote a chip that didn't support 64 bit, right? All right, so it's 64 bits. So how many bytes is that? For it's eight bytes, right? Um, 
So if I've got eight bytes per integer, eight million bytes, and what's eight million bytes? It depends upon whether you're doing base 10 or base two numbering system, right? If we're doing base 10, we can just say it's eight megabytes, right? If we're doing base two, then we're gonna to have to do the conversion. Um, now the question is, if I want to store that on a file, a string, how much space will it take? What's the minimum amount it can take? So let's just let's calculate a lower bound, right? Assume everything is works perfect. Not even worrying about not even worrying about sectors. Just how much data will be on disk. And we're gonna worry about how much our inefficient will be on the disk. Eight million what? Um, as strings? If I take an integer and convert it to a string, which you everyone did, right? Yeah. How many bytes will it take as a string? How many characters will it take? If I take one number, write one integer, how many, how many characters? What's that? What's the largest it could be? Yes. So you're telling me that it's going to take up less Space as a string that has binary value? No, no way. Absolutely not. Cannot happen. Now, if it goes in zero, max, max by two, so if we assume that the numbers are random, right, which they were in our case, then we're going to assume that the average length is going to be half that, right? So how many digits are in the max int? And then divide that by, and then take that take that number and divide by four, and that's going to be the average, right? We can start. So for next time, right? As an exercise, how much space is this? Are these integers going to take on disk? Right, as a string and a byte. Yeah, and that that'll be, and then we'll we'll start there next time, right? And we're out of time. Other classes. Chopping the bit to get in.